did you ever deal with like the the labels? Well, obviously paying late or whatever. But mm. you, did you ever deal with like getting screwed over by some of the labels or I've in a had, major way? I've had some experiences uh, with <laughs> with artists of. Uh, uh, taking your music, I've had experiences with the labels not uh, paying the back end, mm -hmm. um, and the record is out. Right, uh, people taking publishing. I mean, it just uh, you kind of like charge it to the game because these are experiences that you're gonna you're gonna go through. I mean, think about it: the music business, which you know I hate to say this, but the music business is built on exploitation. Absolutely. So everybody is not playing fair. You have people that are opportunists. You have people that are not as talented as you. Yeah. So, you know, that are hustling, trying to make a career out of it. A lot of people, uh, it's not something that a lot of people go to school for and learn how to do. They're just learning it trial and error. They're coming from the streets. All kinds of things are happening. So it's a cast of characters that you're dealing with that, you know, are in the label, outside the label that you're dealing with that, um, you know, it doesn't always go as it should. People don't always follow the protocols. Absolutely. But um, for me, I just have a love for creating music. So I've always let that supersede the business because if you get caught up in the business, you will get turned off. You will get burnt out. You will quit and lose your passion for music. And to me, being able to express myself where you're the vessel and music is coming from above through you. That's right. And you're making music that is touching people and, and making them feel something. That's the most important thing to me than anything. Can we talk? Oh, can we talk? Can we talk? What's up? What's up? It's your boy Ian Vaughn. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Can We Talk R&B podcast. I'm super excited to introduce you guys to my guest today. This is my brother. Okay, this is. I want. I don't want to let the relationship overtake. You know, and high, you know, overtake or overshadow this man's greatness. This is <laughs> a king. This guy has produced and worked with some of the most iconic artists. I'm talking Michael Jackson. I'm talking Beyonce. I'm talking Biggie Smalls. I'm talking Lil Kim. This dude is just that dude. So I'm not gonna refer to him as He Manuel because he goes by Billy Lennox these days. <laughs> but uh, this is my man Fanatic. Big up, man. Thank you for joining us today. No doubt. I like, like that intro. Come on, bro. I got to pay you for that. Come on, man. Come on. Look, it's a barter. It's a barter. No, nah, man, big up, big uh -huh. up. Man, thank you for coming. So no doubt. We're just going to get right into it. Okay. Like, tell us tell us your story. Like, mm -hmm. how did you get into producing, mm -hmm. writing, the whole deal? Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at you right now, uh -huh. and you just emote, you know, or emit the energy of being like an artist, of being yes. just a musician, of just that, mm -hmm. that total vibration. Tell us about it. Uh, definitely in artist mode uh, right now, but I started off as a producer from Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, just traveling back and forth to New York. I was I started out producing hip hop first. Right. And of course, as you um, are sampling records, you get turned on to a lot of R&B and a lot of soul music and mm -hmm. a lot of classic rock music. And so uh, just studying that. Uh, the natural evolution for me was from hip hop into R and B, and of course with the fusion of hip hop and R and B sure. coming together, uh, I, I started out producing a lot of hip hop, and then ventured off into doing R and B with, you know, producing records on Beyonce and Anthony Hamilton. We ain't, we're not just gonna skip past. <laughs> we're not just gonna skip past that. So it's gonna be a lot of light flexing going right. on over here. Just, just understand that. But yeah. I, but but Vincent Herbert found me. And we started producing uh, hip hop records. Um, I was signed to his production company, had a label deal, had an artist by the name of Omniscience from North Carolina that I was producing. Mm -hmm. And then um, from there, uh, I started working with Puffy and started doing more hip hop and eventually got into what, Army. What year is this? Like, when this Oh my gosh, this uh, Little Kim was the first record that I produced, the Crush On You record. Um, I don't know, I guess that was like late 90s or whatever, early 2000s. That I remember that. when I first heard the yeah. Crush On You record. Mm -hmm. This had to be 96 maybe, yeah, mm -hmm. something like that. And yeah. I remember how, you know, I'm a big, I'm from South, I'm from Louisiana, right? Uh -huh. So being from the South, you know, we listen to A-Ball MJG, we listen right. to UGK, mm -hmm. we listen to Outkast, mm -hmm. you know, but I was a fan of all that Southern hip hop, but I was also a fan mm -hmm. of East Coast hip hop. Oh, yeah. And... I, but I'm used to listening to Nas. Mm. I'm listening to, uh, you know, Biggie, of course. Yes. That and New York rap. Yeah, that New York style. I love it, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you drop, well, when y'all, when Lil' Kim comes out with Crush on You, this is like mm -hmm. 96, 97, mm -hmm. 
it was musical. Like the vibe oh, yeah. was just different. It didn't yeah, feel, yeah. you know, it didn't feel like the other hip hop music. Yeah, it had changed at that point. Um, a lot of sampling was going on at that point. Puffy had taken off, uh, looping a lot of popular records. Sure. I um when we were doing hip hop, uh Tribe Called Quest was big at that time right. and they were into a lot of jazz. That's right. So I went like jazz crazy, just like buying a whole catalog of uh jazz, old jazz albums mm -hmm. and studying all those uh musicians that played on those records yeah. and I found Jeff Lorber Fusion mm -hmm. and that was the the sample that we looped up, put the hard drums behind it on the S P twelve hundred and next thing you know, uh it went from my bedroom to like touching the world. So Tell me about yeah. that feeling, though. Like, I know what it's like to be... I know what it's <laughs> like. Not, not nowhere near to have a hit yeah. like that, but I know what it's like to be a songwriter. Mm -hmm. You're writing something. Mm -hmm. You're just riding your car. You're in right. your room, whatever. It's just you and the song. Mm -hmm. And then you're performing it. You're putting yeah. it out in the marketplace, and now you got hundreds of people singing it back yeah. to you. Like, tell me, like, that feeling, like, doing that. Now you got the world... Well, the thing about it is I created that record probably like two or three years before it came out, and I could not sell that track to nobody. Nobody wow. would buy it. Everybody would pass on it. <laughs> and it just so happened that Biggie uh, heard it and had the foresight to see what it could be. Yeah. And, um, you know, when it came out, uh, like I think Little C's had called me and told me we got a hit. And, uh, you know, he was the original one that was on her album. It was right. just him by himself. Right. But the record took off so big that uh, Biggie made her go back and get on the record. Ah. She didn't even like the track at first. Wow. But then, hard enough for right. Her. But then after it took <laughs> off, she went back and put her verse on it. And between uh, Biggie being involved with the record, Little Kim on it, Little C's, Cameron writing the record, writing the verses as a ghostwriter. You put all that magic in there, and everybody was at the height of their, you know, their moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it just, you know, it just turned out to be an incredible record. And even to this day, like I can be in a party, and I can be in the corner, and nobody knows me nobody in, the, knows. in the room, and just seeing people react to that record still to this day, Absolutely. I know that it was a, a very monumental record for a lot of people in different parts of their lives. Whether it was that summer or, sure. or you were in school and it just set the party off. And even for DJs. So yeah, yeah. Um, it's just a great feeling to now, what, 20, 25 years later that it still has it's that still, same energy. Absolutely. Yeah. That's amazing. You think about, um, I guess, music and just mm -hmm. the way music has evolved. Mm -hmm. And you've touched so many different styles mm -hmm. that we're going to touch, touch on. Mm -hmm. But you think about like that record and that timeline, how iconic of a timeline, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Biggie died, uh, I guess, a year or so. He died in right. 97, I believe. Right. Right. So a year or so after that comes out and is revered to this day mm -hmm. as maybe the greatest rapper of all time, mm -hmm. are definitely in that top, in most people's top five. Right. You know, you've had the opportunity to touch an icon be mm -hmm. with Biggie Smalls. Mm -hmm. You know, then you've, worked with Michael Jackson. Mm. We're going to get to that and dive mm. into that. Yeah. Uh, Beyonce and so many artists, like transitioning from hip hop to R and B, like mm -hmm. what was the, what was the pathway to that? Um, for me, um, I had a young artist by the name of Tavares Polk that I was producing at the time. And so I was studying a lot of soul music at that time, just coming back and forth from North Carolina to New York, driving back and forth. Mm -hmm. We would be listening to a lot of soul music. So I would listen to the Ohio Players a lot. I would listen to a mm -hmm. lot of um, Ozzy Brothers records. Ghost. And just, just studying like <laughs> soul music like crazy during that time period. And that was when D'Angelo was out. And so mm -hmm. all of these influences of all the soul music I was into, I started uh, just started producing mm -hmm. um R and B, and I had a guy by the name of Sherrod Barnes that I worked with. That was an exceptional guitar player, mm -hmm. and when we just spoke the same language, loved the same artist. Anything that I could think of in my head, I could, I could, I could sing it to him, or I could play him a voice memo, and he would get it and just add his magic to it. And we just had a great combination, so it was easy for me to slide into that space of doing R and B, yeah. and uh, just writing and and uh, recording and working on that stuff all the time, where all the influences were going into that music. So it was a, it was hip hop, it was R and B, it was soul music. It was just a great time for music. Yeah, and you mentioned that you're from North Carolina. Uh -huh. That, I mean that. That southern vibe, there's a lot of R and B soul or blues oh, vibe, uh you know, vibes that that's mm -hmm. that most artists or people from that area obviously you, you yeah. pick up the, the, the vibrations from yeah. that. 
Yeah, has that influenced some of your style and production? Uh, well, I just think in the South you get exposed to a lot of soul music because, you know, you're going to family reunions. Yes, right. uh, at that time when you were riding in the car, your parents would play that music. Yeah. In the car, they would play it in the house. I know my, my dad used to have this Ozzy Brothers tape that he would just keep in the car all the time. Mm -hmm. And just hearing that that Ron Ozzy and Ernie Ozzy in your head constantly. Yeah. And Al Green, Millie Jackson. So Come you on. get turned on to a lot of Southern soul. Yeah. And, um, you know, in the 70s, they all had their, their region. So, right. you know, you had Cool and the Gang and all of them that were in New York doing that sound. Mm -hmm. You had um, James Brown and Ohio players that were in the Cincinnati area doing what they were doing. In the South, you had Al Green and, and yeah. that Stax music. So right. you were getting soul music, all different types of soul music all the time growing up in the South. And yeah. it just... Uh, it was just uh, almost just like the soundtrack to our day to hear your parents playing soul music everywhere you went. You were just feeling soul music. So it's just entrenched in us. Absolutely. I think about that transition from North Carolina. You mm -hmm. teamed up with Vincent yep. to New York. Mm -hmm. That's a major oh yeah, major difference in terms mm -hmm. of culture. In terms everything. Of, you know, everything. So to go from being, I mean, just being a country boy, right. assuming that you go to New York, you with these big city slickers mm -hmm. making money, mm -hmm. making music, and obviously you get one of your, I guess, is this a, was the Crushing You record your first big record? Yeah, it was my first big record. I mean, I produced a lot of smaller artists during that time period, but New York definitely had a big influence on everything with me, like the way I dressed, the way yeah. I made music. Uh, it was a great time in New York City because hip hop was like at the apex. Mm -hmm. MTV was was really big during that time. Sure. We're introducing hip hop to the world. So uh, we and this uh, black music in general was just going through a lot of transitions from the hip hop to the R and B. Everything was changing. Neo soul was big during that time. Sure. Hip hop and R and B with Mary J. Blige was big during that time. So yeah. it was a it was a Black music was just evolving so much during that time, and it was just a great time to be in New York because it was the mecca of all of that. That's right. So what what was, like, I guess, your first R&B record that made you more transition? Because you, you were part of the Hitman, right? Right, right. I worked with Puffy as the Hitman, but I was mostly doing hip-hop over there. I think the first record that I really did coming out of that camp on the R&B side was probably the Michael Jackson record okay. um, I did. Um, heaven can wait, and um, that's when I got introduced to Teddy Riley, and I was working closely with him, who was I was a big fan of, and uh, such yeah, an iconic producer, of and course. I learned so much working with him. But um, how th how that happen? Like how'd you how'd you team up? Um, we started working on the Heaven Can Wait record, and um, immediately we after we had gotten it all together, and I worked with Teron Bill and Rich Laws with writing it. I was like, this this feels like Lady in My Life. And I was like, I wanted to make a record. Because Michael at that time had just done, you know, the Heal the World and the Free mm -hmm. Willie type records. But he hadn't had like a love ballad in a long time where he was actually talking about an interaction, interaction with a woman. Right. And for me, I wanted to make a record that would be like a staple in, in uh, the black community as this is one of these records you put on when you're spending time with your lady or it, it uh you know, it's the 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 quiet storm type record or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And so we tried to shop it to Kavon Edmonds. He wanted to do the record, couldn't pull the record off. Or oh, he said that we were making him sound like Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. We should just go get Michael Jackson. And mm -hmm. the light bulb went off and I was like, that's right. And so I just started playing Six Degrees of Separation. And a guy by the name of Kenny Quiller was working with Teddy Riley. He knew me. He was from North Carolina as well. And we gave him the record, and like three weeks later, Michael Jackson was like standing here in my face talking to me. That's so, crazy, man. So you know, you 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 grow up on Michael Jackson and the Jackson Five right. and the cartoon and right. him Thriller moment, and then all of a sudden, I'm from Greensboro, North Carolina. I don't know yeah. anybody that knows Michael yeah. Jackson or ever met him, but he's talking to you, and so it's just a very surreal moment. Had you life. ever even considered doing a record for Michael Jackson prior to? I mean, you. I mean, you didn't have that song no. in mind. Him no, 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 no. I mean, I had him in mind when we created the record, but I never thought in a million years I could get, get I could get to him. I right. tried to get to Janet with the record at first, gotcha. but I never thought in a million years because you know it's Michael Jackson. It's Michael you don't Jackson. you don't think. You yeah. can even ever meet him. But right. that whole experience gave me the confidence to realize that we're all human at the end of, of the course. day. We're all six degrees of separation That's to right. anybody. So I I practiced that afterwards, and I I was able to work with so many other artists just by 
you know, doing that and believing that I can get to anybody, you know, somebody knows somebody that knows somebody. So what did, what did you learn from my, working with Michael Jackson? Uh, he's a, he's a very uh, much of a perfectionist. Mm. Um, he spent like two hours warming up his vocals mm. before he even recorded one note wow. with his uh, vocal coach. I think he record he did a vocal warm up for like two hours and then sang for thirty minutes and then left. Wow. And then was like, you know, I'll be back tomorrow to finish the record. But just really paying attention to detail and the nuances of the demo. He was trying to recreate everything. Mm -hmm. And it was just uh just to see him in there singing, it was just like Surreal. Yeah, right. Like even the takes that they didn't even keep on the record, just to see some of the stuff that he was doing vocally, you could tell like he was like really been developed, really seasoned as a vocalist and Absolutely. knew exactly what he wanted to do. I mean, Michael Jackson yeah. is that dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rest definitely. in peace, rest in power to yeah. the king of, king of power. And, you know, he, he passed away today, too. So this is Really? Like, uh, yeah. To, the, man, the, the, the that, so that was, that's been seven years now? Uh, It's been longer than that. Like, Eight right? years? Eight, wow. nine years. I think oh, wow. Nine. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. He, yeah. Man, that's crazy. Which is, which is crazy because I, uh, I had a dream about him passing away, like, two months before that and it was like I woke up and it was like this is a hoax this couldn't be true or whatever and of right. course he he wasn't gone then but then when he passed it just it just hit me again and I was just like I was like wow I was like I felt this feeling before it was kind of like a deja wow. vu moment when he passed so. man that, that the world stopped for, yeah, yeah. For, for most folks Definitely. for sure I talk about Michael Jackson being maybe the most famous name mm -hmm. since Jesus yeah 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 like we, yeah, yeah. you think in history, you think about names of people. Yeah, yeah. I can't think of another person in history since yeah. Jesus no. uh, that everybody knows. Yeah, I mean, yeah. All around the world, you know. I mean, kids, kids that right. are born now, three, right. four years old, are still being influenced by yeah, Michael, Jackson. Michael Jackson. And to say that you like that's we've we've touched on one legend mm -hmm. and Biggie. Mm -hmm. Now we're touching on the the biggest one of all mm -hmm. and Michael Jackson. So right. you. You've done more than just from that experience, being able to work with these two guys, more than most aspiring producers, musicians, whatever, to get, have an opportunity to get records with both of these guys. I mean, it, it kind of blows me away sometimes that I'm from this small town and I've worked with probably six of the biggest icons of that era. Sure. And, and popular music and... You know, you're always just moving forward and always trying to create the next experience. So you rarely get a chance to think back in retrospect to the things that you've done in your career. And I mean, I appreciate this show because this gives me a moment to reflect on that. And sometimes this business is so, so tough to get through that sometimes sure. you need those moments that you actually get to reflect on it and appreciate what you've done. Right. And uh, it gives you the confidence to keep going. Did you have like a publishing deal um, at that time or were mm -hmm. you um, right after I signed right after I did the little Kim record, I signed with Warner Chapel with Angelique Miles and um, I was uh, I was published by them mm -hmm. and whatnot. Nice. And that's yeah. is that how you got opportunities to work with these other artists or? Nah, actually, my publisher, I mean, no disrespect to her, but my <laughs> publisher, I didn't really have a relationship with. I just knew them in passing. Yeah. But they didn't really help me get any of the placements. All the placements I got was just me out there hustling. One foot in front of the other. Yeah. Uh, uh, Eli Davis was my manager who manages Anthony Hamilton now. Yeah. He and I just hitting the streets and just being in the clubs and the studios and the uh, label offices and just meeting people. We were able to to get to them. And most of the most of the, most of my placements, uh, one, they were records that I had done a year or two years prior to them even taking the record. Mm -hmm. And two, um, they were either the manager or directly to the artist that I got to to place a record. Because, you know, when you're trying to place a record on somebody, the, the artist is dating somebody, so her boyfriend is a producer, yeah. so he's trying to get yeah, on the yeah. album. The A&R has, um, has his people that he manages that he's trying to get on the album. Yeah. The president of the label has some. Everybody has an agenda of trying to get somebody on the album, so uh -huh. it's very difficult to get past those people to get to uh, the artist. But well, I was luckily was able to get directly to the artist or directly to the manager to get on these records. So That's fantastic. Yeah. You did... Um, so coming from the Michael Jackson, uh, so this there was three albums. There was a uh, uh, Rock My World was on that album, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then Butterflies, right? And then Heaven Came Away right. was the third single yeah. on that album. And I imagine if he would have actually did a video to that record, Man. with his imagination, Absolutely. what it what it would have been. So, Man. 
uh, that but that's was, still a lot of people's favorite songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It it took off, and I see it on YouTube. I see a lot of people singing it. I see a lot of people talking about that record still to this day. So I can only imagine what would have happened had he followed through and not fallen out with Sony. Gotcha. You know? Look, I just got to know my producer text. Mm -hmm. It's been 14 years since Michael Jackson died. Wow. That, that went that quick, <laughs> right? Wow. I remember it. feels like years, it's almost yesterday. Man, man years ago, I was yeah. in L.A., I want to say this was, I was promoting an album uh, back in 2014, matter of fact, uh -huh. and uh, we were doing a radio tour, so uh -huh. we were up and down from San Francisco all the way down to uh, uh, St. Louis and Pispo okay. and uh, L.A. and Fresno, all that area, but we passed by, I believe it was uh, Santa Barbara, Santa Ooh. Maria, wherever, and that's yeah. where Neverland was. Right, right, right. So we pull up to Neverland Ranch, uh -huh. and this is 2014. At, uh -huh. that, po at that time, I'm yeah. sorry, it was five years at that time. I oh, remember okay. this. We pull up. And there are people, people from still still out there. People from Germany, yeah. people from London, yeah. people from mm -hmm. all over the world yeah. pulling up yeah. and they're writing notes wow. on the on the wow. uh, on the concrete, you know, in front of the in front of the gate. Wow, I wrote crazy. a note and yeah. I sang Heal the World oh, wow. to the crowd. Nice. It, was, it may have been like fifteen people out there nice, at nice. that moment. But that's something that people and they, apparently they go out and they pressure yeah. wash the uh the the uh writing every day and then wow. every day. It's wow. graffitied again with, with notes and tributes to Michael Jackson. That's almost like some of the icons like uh, uh, Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix are over in Europe. Sure. And people are still putting flowers and memorials um, in front of their grave to this day. So, they show you the yeah. power of music and yeah. the impact oh, that these people have on all, on all of our lives from a soundtrack standpoint. Mm -hmm. so, and, and, and let me just say, like, just being in the room with him... You, there was like a vibe and a spirit in the room that you could feel like he was not of this world. Mm -hmm. Like it was just so different. And then when he talks to you, he's looking in your face and you feel his humility and his sincerity and his, and his conversation. Absolutely. And I was just like, it's just a really weird feeling like, yo, this guy is not really from here. Like he's definitely something very special. Absolutely. Man, yeah. shout out to Michael Jackson. Rest in power. So from there, um, well, you, you mentioned Anthony Hamilton. Uh -huh. So you worked on, he's from North Carolina. Yes. So you got a chance to work on, with him as well. Mm. I mean, we, I know we've talked about this yeah. before. So mm. how that how that uh, come to be? Well, I've known Anthony well before he was signed. Uh, producer by the name of Mark Sparks, which was my partner. Mm -hmm. And Eli um, was my best friend. So Anthony has always been in the mix, even when he was singing backgrounds for D'Angelo. And before that, when he had a deal on Uptown Records, all of that, um, like Anthony's always been around. So if you did music, you ended up producing records on him. I think I did maybe six or seven records on him before he even got a deal. Mm -hmm. So I've always been in and out of uh, his life uh, producing music for him before. So it was only natural that we would link up again, which that album he got nominated for a Grammy for this also. Is, this is first album? Yeah. No, 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 no. This is like uh, maybe his third or fourth album. Okay, okay. But this was the uh, Second time he had been nominated for a Grammy. Gotcha. My second Grammy nomination and uh, whatnot. But he's a amazing artist, one of our Absolutely. greatest voices of all of this era. For sure, of this you era. Know? For yeah, sure, de you, definitely. He he's when Anthony sings like he's tapping into your, your, the pastor, yeah. the preacher. Mm -hmm. He's tapping to your uncle. Definitely. He's tapping into like you know all he, you know definitely. from all the greats. Mm -hmm. It's like all of that comes out of him yeah. when he's singing. You can just feel it, no matter yeah. what he's singing, whether it's one of his tunes or, yeah. or, or something else. Yeah, and I like working with him because oh, it's always a challenge to take him someplace that he hasn't been musically sure. and whatnot. And when you're working with a vocalist like that, it's easy to create because you you just let your imagination go and say, I want to. I want to do this on him. Or what if he did this or that? You know? Absolutely. Big shot. We got yeah. Anthony Hamilton. No big, doubt. Big brother, we need to have you on the Can no We doubt. Talk R&B podcast. <laughs> big shout. So from there, you get to work with, well, I don't know. You tell me what came next from that. Oh, I mean, Boys the Man happened. Come on. Uh, Angie Stone happened. Uh, and I think right after that, Beyonce happened. So you go, yeah. so now, so I didn't even, I, I mean, I knew about Boys the Man, mm. but I'm mm. <laughs> Another legendary, oh, yeah. iconic. So you, mm -hmm. Angie Stone, another yes. legend. Like man, you just yes. touching everybody. And I, I, during that time, I forgot. I also worked with Brian McKnight during that time. Come on, man. I had done a record with him when he was on Mercury. And, yeah. Um, so what? What album was that? The uh, U Turn album. No, this or? was like a hip hop record. But I okay, requested okay. Brian McKnight to sing the hook on the record. Oh, and nice. So he, we brought him in the studio, and that was the first time I got to work with him, which was like really, like he's like. What record was that? Um, was that Mace? Nah, this was uh, Paula Perry 
did a record. She was signed there at the time, and we um, I looped up the "For the Lover in You" by Shalimar and Brian McKnight sang the hook on it Excellent. and uh, knocked it out in like fifteen minutes. Of course, and just like stacked vocals and Man, did Brian all kinds is of stuff. That dude, I learned so much stuff from him just in that short period of time of how to arrange vocals and things like that. Nice. And then right after that, it was Black Street in the Mace record. Come on, yeah. No. Just keep just Teddy keep, Riley again. Yeah, I'm like just you know, just just, and keep, Black Street. just keep flexing yeah, on so, him. Keep flexing so, on him. So I just um just you know just hustling and just constantly running into people, and then your name starts getting around. People want to start working with you, which is how the Beyonce record happened. Ran into an old friend of mine that went to music school with me in Atlanta at the Art Institute, uh-huh. and she was like, "You want to submit something for Beyonce?" I was like. For sure. That's just crazy, bro. <laughs> yeah. I have re- I have yeah. been in writing sessions yeah. with so many producers and yeah. like, we're trying to get a Beyonce placement. Right. We're trying to get a so-and-so placement. It's not easy. This, right. Of course. Right. And I mean, like, you just you just walk, but yeah. you're walking into your calling. Right, you right. Because I, I didn't even think any of it when I just gave it to her. I just gave her a bunch of tracks that I was working on at the time. And then they called me at like 2 o'clock in the morning and, was, and were like, you need to come to Hit Factory tomorrow to mix the record. I was like, mix re- what record? And it was like, <laughs> Oh, Beyonce wrote to one of your tracks, and um, it's going to be on the album, so you guys got to mix it. And I was like, oh, wow. And this happened like probably six to seven months Wow! after I gave them the record. I never heard anything back. That's why I was like, you got to just plant seeds. You That's can't right. sit there and just worry about, like, am I going to get the placement? Right. Like, once you turn it over to them, it's out of your hands, and right. you just hope that it uh, they love what you give them. Man, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Most, most artists, I mean, I guess songwriters, producers, um, you know, you're giving game right now because mm. a lot of them, you know, like, I, I got this artist. I've, mm. I've gotten calls. Mm. Yo, we got an opportunity with this right. particular artist. Mm. We're trying to write songs, right. to try to submit or whatever. Mm. Um, but when you're in that flow, you're right. and it's nothing that no one else can do. No, no. And it just happens organically. And like, I'm like that with placements. I'm like that with chasing down checks from the label and everything. Right. It's like, once you plant the seed, you got to just move on to the next phase of whatever it is you're trying to create or, or opportunities you're trying to create. Not just sit there and focus on that one thing mm-hmm. because uh, it takes forever with this to get the record done, right. to get the check, to get the first half, get that's the back end. All right. that right. stuff just takes the royalties. All that stuff takes time. So you got to just keep planting seeds. Just keep going. Does, did you ever deal with like the, the labels or obviously – paying late or whatever but mm. you, did you ever deal with like getting screwed over by some of the labels or in, in a major had, way i've had some experiences uh with <laughs> with artists of uh, uh taking your music i've had experiences with the labels not uh paying the back end mm-hmm. um and the record is out right uh people taking publishing i mean it just uh you kind of like charge it to the game because these are experiences that you're gonna you're gonna go through i mean think about it the music business which, you know, I hate to say this, but the music business is built on exploitation. Absolutely. So everybody is not playing fair. You have people that are opportunists. You have people that are not as talented as you. Yeah. So, you know, that are hustling, trying to make a career out of it. A lot of people, uh, it's not something that a lot of people go to school for and learn how to do. They're just learning it trial and error. They're coming from the streets. All kinds of things are happening. So... It's a cast of characters that you're dealing with that, you know, are in the label, outside the label that you're dealing with that, um, you know, it doesn't always go as it should. People don't always follow the protocols. Absolutely. But um, for me, I just have a love for creating music. So I've always let that supersede the business because if you get caught up in the business, you will get turned off. You will get burnt out. You will quit and lose your passion for music. And to me, being able to express myself where you're the vessel and music is coming from above through you. That's right. And you're making music that is touching people and, and making them feel something. That's the most important thing to me than anything. So what are you listening to now? Like who you tapped into? Oh, ooh, now we uh, had these, com- you know, yeah, look, we had these conversations all the time. My wife be like, screaming matches. But, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. um, right now, Oh, um, I don't, uh, I don't really stick to one genre. I, I, I mean, every Friday I'm listening to Spotify to see who's coming out and mm-hmm. see what people are doing, and just trying to stay in the loop with what, where music is going and what people are doing. But uh, I jump around and I listen to pop and I listen to uh, uh, rock. I listen to R and B. I listen to hip hop. I listen to a little bit of everything. Yeah. Haven't really found anybody that I'm like crazy about other than maybe Nick ha- Nick Hakeem is dope. Omar Apollo is dope. Nice. Um, 
Ooh, this is, this is not a lot. It's not I, a lot. I know we, I know we uh, both when uh, Silk Sonic when they oh, came out with right. uh, with Bruno and right. uh, and uh, Anderson Park came out with we both having a conversation right. with our other brother. That's a conversation. But, <laughs> shout <out to> brother. <laughs> but I think we were on the same page, right? Right. right. As it relates to uh, you know the impact and how they at least with that uh, with uh, what's the first single from Leave uh, the Door Open. Leave the Door Open. Yes. From them and uh, I just although it was a I don't want to say a parody. But mm. it was a, you know, it was a costume wearing, right, 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 uh, uh, of of that particular style of music right. from the '70s and so mm. forth. That just leads me to what what era mm. do you feel had the best R&B music? Is it the '70s, the '80s, '90s? Uh, the soul music was was great in the '70s, in yeah. the '60s. Yeah, I think R&B probably in the '80s and early '90s. Mm-hmm. But you could see it was uh, it was dil- diluted each decade, each decade a- as sure. as it went down, and even with the the Silk Sonic, like that was like an amazing song. When you right. hear that music, it almost sounded like a Gamble and Huff mm-hmm. record from Philly International. But Imagine had uh, I don't know a, a serious soul singer had sang that record and didn't put the comedy spin on it. What that record would have really done, right? You know what I'm saying? But but um. I love that record. Of course, I didn't really like the album, but that song, mm-hmm. it was just... Um, it just was it. Yeah, it was. It was. We argued with your brother, Emmett, yeah, about it. Emmett tried to hate on that's it. That's right. We, he tried to hate on it. <laughs> <laughs> but that song, the elements in that song, um, I always tell people now, because they're always talking about we can we can bring R&B back, right? Right, right. R&B is never going to come back to what we know as right. like the heyday and the essence of R&B. It's, it's, it has to be remixed. They have to get a facelift. Mm-hmm. It has to change, which it always does evolve, right? But the thing about it is soul music will never, ever, ever die. Right. And when you can do soul music, that's coming from a place that resonates with so many people. Absolutely. And that's why that record cut through. That's right. That's why a record like, um, what's the record um, Tyrese did? Um Shame. Shame, yeah. That's why that record cut through. Sure. Because that's soul music, and that's coming from a place that everybody loves, and it's timeless. And you can feel it. Right, like right. It, it just, it just Definitely. It's just a feeling more than, than anything. It had, uh, it had the, the, the lush arrangements, the various changes, but when you listen to R&B today, it's usually like that eight-bar loop, and they're mm-hmm. just singing over that eight-bar loop, but right. it's not a whole lot going on. Even if you put too many harmonies in a song, right. you know, uh, um, but the, uh, people look down on it. But the thing about it is is that we have to figure out how to, um, how to change the sound again because when we were listening to it, a lot of people were coming from the church. Yeah. Devontae was from the church. That's Rodney right. Jerkins from the church. Teddy Riley was from the church. Uh, all these people were coming from the church. And, you know, when you come from the church, you're working with real singers. Yeah, that's right. The choir director's official. That's right. the, the music director's official. Yeah. It's chord progressions. It's changing. It's changes in the record. Right. It's coming from a very spiritual place that's, that's embedded in our DNA. That's so. Right. When they when they came on the scene, they changed everything, and then the hip hop element was added to it. Mm-hmm. But hip hop may have diluted um, diluted R and B and may have altered it. Yeah. It was huge, but it also uh, simplified That's the right. music. And right. when you simplify the music like that, now it becomes to the point where everybody can do it. And so you lost it. some of the fundamental right. things Definitely. that made R and B music. One hundred percent. We talk about like production. A lot of guys make beats or whatever. Mm. But one thing about like a lot of the music that you do, mm. even if it's sample, you also incorporate live instruments. Oh, of course, of course, that type of thing. So we talk about like these eras. Talk about let's say the seventies, for example. Everybody played an instrument. Right. And I mean, it was masterful at it. Yes. You know yes. what I mean? Uh, big shout out to one of my guitar mentors, uh, Kim Sharp. Mm. This guy who's played with the Commodore. He's played mm. with Santa, Santa, oh, nice. Santana. He's played with Prince. Uh-huh. Um, and he's produced some some cookie cutter stuff as right. well to make money. Right. But this dude is a masterful guitar player. Well, and would tell me at 17, mm-hmm. he said, man, like, we would, we have to, like, at 17 years old, we, yeah. were in the, we were in the shed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, we, we practicing for hours and hours. Well, when you, when you play an instrument, then signature comes in. Of course. So Santana plays guitar, but he don't play like Prince. That's right. Prince plays guitar. He didn't play like Jimi Hendrix. Right. All these different people, when you bring the human element into it, it changes the sound. That's right. You know what I'm saying? It's so, almost like an accent. Right, right. Yeah, so, like, so we, we can speak the same language, right. but it's, it's, it sounds different coming from me. So if we all got back to playing instruments in our music, 
everything would sound different. Mm -hmm. Elton John plays piano, but he don't play piano like Billy Preston was playing piano. So, or Little Richard. So the thing about it is, when you 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 stop, um, our the new generation doesn't go to church like we had to go to church. That's right. So they're not learning music in church. It's not in the schools. So they're not learning how to play in the in in the music programs in the school. So they're resort resorted to programming. Mm -hmm. When you're programming, everything is on the grid. Everything is mm -hmm. exact. So you're not getting the human element. Not getting those inflections. Right, right, and that's what creates signature. That's what separates all these different artists in the '80s, '70s, '60s, or whatever. It's just like the human element. So the only way we can change this is we have to get back to that. We have to get back to fusion. Mm -hmm. If you look at every icon out there, it was a fusion. I, I could take a group like the police. Mm -hmm. They were mixing ska and, and rock. Right. And it had its own sound. Um, everybody that was fusion sound, uh, different genres together, that's how they were creating their own sound. And mm -hmm. right now, everything sounds the same. Okay. Yeah. It's just different singing. And there's a lot of talented, really dope singers, but they're all singing Within this over frame. the same type of tracks. Mm -hmm. And so you could close your eyes and you can't really tell the difference musically. Like when D'Angelo came out and you hear a D'Angelo record, yeah. you know it as soon as it comes on That's by the right. signature stuff he's doing on the keys and everything. Right. And so we got to get back to signature. That's how you're going to separate it. So for me as an artist and a producer, I always try to fuse live instrumentation with what's going on today so that it does have its own sound that nobody else can duplicate but you. So in R and B, when you think about like as a fan of R and B, mm. the ranking, mm. like you have, you mentioned D'Angelo. I know mm. he's one of your one of Definitely. your favorite guys. We every time we talk about it, you say, "Man, it, it does it have what? Did, what would D'Angelo do?" Right, you right. Say that you know you've given me advice on yeah. different things that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. um, so, who would you like if you gave me a list? five people specifically mm -hmm. of artists. Mm -hmm. I know I, I can name a couple of them for you. You, you <laughs> tell, I know I, I already know D'Angelo's one uh -huh. and I know Prince yeah. is at the top of the yeah, ring. Yeah, yeah, I dude. already know that. <laughs> so dive into that. Like the the influence that guys like Prince, D'Angelo have on you, you know Uh Prince, D'Angelo, uh the Ozzy Brothers, mm -hmm. Ohio players, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe cool in the gang. Okay. But just uh, people that were really musical, people that had their own sound, people that could do it vocally as well as musically. Right. Um, I was just really into. Um, those are those are my staple. Those are the ones when I'm stuck that I go back and listen to and try to get inspiration from. Of course, Michael Jackson always too. But yeah. but those are the main ones. Uh, new artists. Mm. <laughs> not so much, but I, I mean, but right. I, I, I listen to it. Yeah, it's just not. But they, not ain't, so they ain't tapping but, the. But put it like this. Put it like this. It's great for oh. the bedroom, though. It's yes. Great, yes. like all the slow stuff and the mid tempo stuff that people are creating, definitely creates a vibe in the bedroom. Definitely, uh, when you want to spend time with your lady, all that stuff is like perfect. Like yeah. they're hitting all the right emotions uh, musically, and it's it's great for that. But. I don't really hear a lot of up tempos. I don't hear a lot of diversity in the music. You don't hear change. life in the music, right? Yeah, so right. We talked about so like it's mostly like vibe music. I hear a lot right. of vibe, a lot music. of vibes. A lot of people doing a lot of ballads. Yeah. You know, where's the mid tempo? You know, I don't dance. I haven't danced in a long time. Yeah, like, where's yeah. the up tempo that makes you want to dance? I don't. I don't really hear that anymore. Right, man. You know? I don't know. It's, it's funny when you think about um, like from not dance music. Mm. You play Earth, Wind, and Fire. Mm -hmm. You play Frankie Beverly Mays. Mm -hmm. You talk about Isaac Brothers. These guys, you know, you already know how I feel about Isaac. Yeah. The Isaacs, yeah. you know, Definitely. to me, you don't really, you know, those guys have been making music since the 50s. I know, it's crazy, right? Ain't that crazy? Since yeah. the 50s. And I'm still playing uh -huh. the Isleys. Like, yeah. my, you know, I'm still ra uh -huh. raving, ra raving about them. Mm. Do we have a, a, definitely from the 90s, definitely from the 90s, mm -hmm. but do we have any uh, young musicians that you've maybe tapped into that, are touching some of those elements that just need to be refined or that you would like, like to work with and maybe bring some of that out? Uh, <laughs> um, the last cast that I really wanted to work with was probably Alicia Keys or, or, or R. Kelly. Um, maybe Miguel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Miguel is dope. Um, but I, I haven't, heard, I haven't heard a lot. It kind of just stopped when it got to Chris Brown and 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 Miguel and people like that. It kind of mm -hmm. just stopped, and uh, I haven't really 
one thing yeah. you, we're not even we're not hearing like there's a lot of mm. talented guys that I'm right. coming across right. that are incredible. Some of them incredible musicians, mm -hmm. incredible singers. But obviously, because the the way we consume music is different now. Right. Well, we're that's another thing. Yeah, we don't we don't live with the music like we used to. Right. And some of those albums, you either got to see it in concert, and it makes you go back and revisit the album. Right. Some of it is you got to live with the album and hear it a couple of times. Right. Sometimes you got to ride with it. Um, I just know, even for hip hop, you know, when we used to consume albums, we used to live with the album for like weeks yeah. and months that you would just like, that was the album you listened to all summer. I used, to, right. I used to live with Pizza for Dominoes, and I used to just listen to like Run DMC, like that whole summer, just driving yeah. and listening to it as I'm delivering. That's right. And it just became an experience for me. Um, and the same way with Gangstar and some of those other artists, but yeah. it's just. Uh, uh, even the chronic, like you, you listen to the chronic like the whole summer for a whole year. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, yeah. so we don't really spend that much time because there's so many artists coming out, and that's that's the problem that I have with R&B and hip hop is just so oversaturated where it's two thousand artists signed and unsigned coming right. out every single week. It's just hard to really digest it and really live with it, and and just consume what they're what they're really trying to uh, get you to feel. But you know, you just you move on to the next one every single week. So right. I, I guess the, the way we consume music now, it's all microwavable, right? Yeah, so it's yeah. all instant. Mm -hmm. But R and B is not made. To, it's not really set up to be an instant thing. It's, mm, it's set up nah. to be cooked in the oven. Right, right. You it's know, we experience. preparing this. Okay, right. we need to get the guitars in mm -hmm. here. That's mm -hmm. the season. We need to get yeah. these pianos, these mm -hmm. organs, whatever we're doing, uh, some horns or whatever mm -hmm. we're doing. Need that thing. Put it in the oven. Yeah. Let it bake a little bit, and that's you know that's that soul food. That's when right. we all can feel it in the which, which substance. Which is disheartening as an artist because think about when you're making your your music. Mm -hmm. Like I think you called me two or three months before you even finished the record, right. where you had just been working on it and working on it and working on it and just adding more and more elements to it. That's right. And and I'm the same way. Like for me, it takes me weeks to make a record. And sometimes months because I'm just adding more and more stuff to it. And it goes through all this process mm -hmm. that you spent all this time writing and recording this record. And then it comes out and it lasts for about maybe two weeks. Right. And then people are on to something, on else. something else. Absolutely. So, so it's, 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 um, you know, you put all that into that, into your music. You want people to really spend time with your music. So right. that's kind of hard to deal with right now where we're at. It's just too many artists, man. Man. And it was never even set up to be like that because uh, 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 usually they would, they would work on an album and then go tour mm -hmm. and then they go sit down for a second that's and right. experience life. That's right. So they have something, something to write, to write about. about. And then they would go back in. Now it's like you're on tour and making uh, new music at the exact same time. So you never really go away. Yeah. So there's no anticipation. And, you know, the artists that really know how to do it, like a Beyonce, like a D'Angelo, they know how to disappear for a second. Yeah. And make you want it. And then when they come back, it's so refreshing and it's so different. And they haven't just been in your face the whole time. I remember Maxwell, remember he went on that long yeah. hiatus. Yeah, 10 years. 10 years. Yeah. And I, 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 it seems yeah. like he's on one now. Mm -hmm. But, at, he, and I remember in the interview, there's like, Maxwell, like, we, yeah. we want we want some music from you. And he was like, man, I just needed to take this time to, you know, this, when he came out with Pretty Wings, right. he said this, I think that was a uh, Black Summer Nights. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, I just need to take some time to just experience. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. gotta, you gotta definitely live. I haven't touring you put it for so many years, and mm -hmm. now I just need to actually live so I can yeah. have something to talk about. And I think now a lot of those artists, it's just a money grab. Like they just constantly just stay on the road to make money. Yeah, and it's so much easier for them to just go out and sing their hits every night than go into the studio and shut everything down and just try to create a whole project. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot, you know. So um, a lot of those artists just stay on tour. You know? Any advice you have for, like, for the new generation of artists? Like, what what would you tell them? Like, listen, if you're making music just mm -hmm. for money, mm -hmm. obviously the intention's not there, so you may or may not get it that way. But if you make music, you know what I'm saying? Like, do you have something for that? That's, that's hard because uh, uh, I know when I started off making music, it wasn't for money. It was just being able to create something that they could play on the radio or play in the club. Mm -hmm. But, like, um, I just, I suggest that, you know, you take your time and you don't flood the market with music. Like, just take time to make a project and live with it because you should be, it should take you a, a year to live it. It should take you a year to make the, the album. It should take you a year to tour it. And mm -hmm. it should take you another year to shut down 
and and relive some i mean get some new experiences to ride that, that's over that's over you know what I'm saying? Over. so so i would just say i would suggest take your time i would also suggest that you study and mm-hmm. try to be impactful in what you're creating so that when it comes out it's a moment like people right. stop and pay attention to exactly what you're doing yeah. versus just running to just drop something and 6 months later you got something else out like chris brown i can't even think of the last time there was any real anticipation for a new Chris Brown record because he's always just putting out music and it's like, it's not even a moment anymore. Mm. And he's like official. Yeah. Like the real deal, but it's like there's no anticipation and it makes you feel like that he didn't really put his time into like, let me give you guys something that you haven't really experienced before. Sure, and sure. just make it a moment. Yeah, I think his last album was like a double disc. Or right. Like, uh, well, it wouldn't be a disc, but... I mean, he uh, put out 40, 40 songs. 40 songs, songs. right. Like, all right. 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 So what what do you work or what are you working on right, on right now? Oh, it's Billy Lennox time right now. Billy Lennox, yeah. tell us about it. Tell uh, us about so it. so Billy Lennox is this alter ego I created during the pandemic, and that was the first time where you I wasn't really producing for other artists because there was nothing going on. The labels were shut down and all this, and mm-hmm. so I dove um, delve dove. I got into my artistry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, I just was really uh, taking this moment to be the artist that I always wanted to be. Um, I I locked myself in the room um, 24 hours a day, just writing and recording. No showering, no nothing. I was just making music all day. Just just being funky. (laughs) All day day and all night, just making music. And as... um, like and, you know, the repetition kick in. And yeah. once repetition kicks in, you start really finding yourself. I suggest for everybody that wants to be an artist, get your own equipment, learn how to record, because you're really, when you're not on the clock and you have all day and all night to work on music, you'll really start to find yourself as, as an artist. You'll start to find a sound and a direction, you know. And so I um, I started working on it. I started, it's a, it's, it's a fusion of uh, pop and rock, but it's hip hop and R and B and soul uh, dipped in it also. Sure, but it's but it's more rock stuff. It's more the rock side of of what I wanted to do. That lane is wide open. Yeah, we created it, but we got segregated out of that yeah. out of that genre for some reason. Talk about it. There's no no other people of color in that space. Really, all of, all of those are the cornerstones yeah. of R and B as well. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. there. Um, um, I think the last. The last big superstar we had was probably Lenny Kravitz. That was 25 years ago wow. since he's had a hit record. That's right. And when you look at the genre, I'm like, every time black artists get the opportunity to create in that space, they become iconic from mm-hmm. Little Richard to Chuck Berry to uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix mm-hmm. to Terrence Trent Darby to Prince to Lenny Kravitz. All these people are iconic. Yeah. And they were expressing themselves in that space of rock music. And so... Somehow we got segregated out of that. Um, you see Willow Smith and a couple of other artists doing it, Tapping but in, yeah. but it's not really like mainstream, mm-hmm. you know, pop rock music. And there's, this stuff is really angry, though. I don't know why yeah, it's so yeah. angry. I think rock and roll should be sexy and beautiful, yeah. and, and, and you should have fun, and it should be, you know, expressing yourself. It should have fashion and sexuality and all this stuff in it yeah, that um, that made it, interesting because you know we express ourselves like no other yeah you know when we when we get into our bag so i'm trying to bring all that 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 back fashion show sexy rock and roll good time um good feeling type music so i got uh, this is my fourth single that's out now um and as you go to my instagram page and or youtube and look at the videos and the music you'll see those elements in there and I'm just in my own lane right now, just doing my own thing. And that feels good more than anything to be creating something that doesn't sound like everybody else's record. But, you know, when you go down that path, just know that when you're doing something different, sometimes it takes a little longer for people to catch on. But you just got to stay committed to what you're doing and believe in what you're you're putting out heat. You're putting out some serious heat, man. I got some in the can, too. Come on, man. Look, so. fanatic, bro, my brother. Thank you <laughs> no for doubt. coming, bro. Thank no you doubt. for blessing us on the mic, giving us some game. Always, big always. shout out, man. Look, y'all. Thank y'all for tapping in. This is mm-hmm. Can We Talk R and B Pod. Listen. Oh, and I'll, follow me though. Um, One hundred. Um, fanatic. Um, AKA fan, uh, fanatic. AKA Billy Lennox on Instagram. Yes. Follow me there. Uh, you can see everything that I've been doing, everything that I've been creating, and um, you know, just just come along for the ride. No doubt, no doubt. Y'all tap in. Mm-hmm. Appreciate y'all. Thank you.